Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Lovers of Self. In the scripture that we're about to read, Paul makes a long list of traits that will be prevalent in the last days. So we're going to do something that we don't normally do. We don't usually do this. We're going to read the first part of verse 1, then we're going to skip down to the last part of verse 4. But you don't have to worry or be concerned. We won't be taking anything out of context by doing that because, as I said, Paul made a list of characteristics and a list of traits that will overtake the whole world in the last days. But we're only going to be focusing on one of those characteristics today. Therefore, if it's a list, then it's kind of impossible to take anything out of context. So with that said, the, the characteristics that we're going to focus on today is self-love. It's, it's the first of the characteristics to start the list, and it's the last of the characteristics. Paul starts with self-love, and he ends the list with self-love. So it seems like self-love is the head and tail of everything that's going wrong in the world today. It's like the parentheses around the whole thing. So with that said, let us turn to our scripture, which is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and the last part of verse 4. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. As I said, Paul makes a list of several characteristics that is flooding the world in the last days. He said, there'll be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and several other choice words that Paul uses to, to make a list. But we're focusing on lovers of self rather than lovers of God. People, and even some Christians included, are so caught up in the things of this world that they put God second place in their lives. Each and every one of us are guilty of doing that at some point in time, some point in our life. But someone might feel a way about that, about that statement, and we'll claim, how can I be guilty of putting God second place? You don't even know me. True, but take a look at this. When someone says something about you or something that you don't like, you're offended. You, how should I say, feel away. There's something inside you that changes. And when I say changes, I mean change in your attitude. It's like when God spoke to Cain concerning the sacrifice and let him know that it was inferior to his brother Abel's sacrifice. God wasn't upset. God wasn't angry. He was trying to keep Cain on the right track. That's all. This is what God asked Cain. He said, why are you angry? Why do you look so dejected? Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. The King James Version puts it this way. Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Our countenance falls every time something is said to us or about us other than praise because after all we have feelings too and that just hurt my feelings brother Kenny my feelings are now officially hurt it's like that saying that we sometimes see on t-shirts or on posters I've got one nerve left and you're standing on it we always seem to have one nerve left and someone is always standing on it. I remember many years ago, I had been saved very long and I don't really remember what it was all about or what was going on 
but someone at work wanted me to do something and I didn't want to do it because I thought it wasn't treating me fairly. I responded with, I'm not going to do that. And I gave my reasons why not. And all his response was, you're the Christian. That hit me like a ton of bricks. And you better believe that I never made that mistake again at work. The problem is, we have become lovers of self. We have forgotten what Paul tried so hard to teach us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and verse 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. We are not our own. In other words, you do not own yourself. I do not own myself. Therefore, we must honor God with our body. When we begin to do what pleases God and try to protect our own little feelings, then we are usurping the authority that God has over us. And I want to camp out here for just a little bit so that we can think about this for a moment. Because this is pretty deep. I want you to fully understand what it is I'm trying to say here. So, what I'm saying is that when we are offended at what someone says to us or about us, we are now taking offense for God because it is He that they are insulting. I mean, since we don't own ourselves, we're not our own, we should no longer be offended for someone else, which is God, because it's God that they're talking about. God is big enough to be offended for himself. So whatever people do to us, or whatever people say about us, it is not to us, but to God. It's about God himself. I want you to look with me at Acts chapter 9, verse 4 through 6. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuted. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Look, Paul had no clue who it was that was talking to him. He searched his mind. He searched his thoughts. I'm not persecuting anyone except these heathen Christians. Who can this be then? No matter how hard he tried to imagine, no matter how hard he tried to think, he couldn't come up with the name Jesus. So he had to ask, who are you, Lord? The early Christians did not take it to heart about their persecution. They knew fully well it was their spiritual enemy persecuting them on account of Jesus. And all their insults fell on him. Have you ever taken into consideration this verse before? Romans chapter 15 verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. People... Nowadays are so offended. They're even offended for other people. And when you ask that person who should be offended, if they're offended, they say like, no, not really. But yet someone else is offended and totally offended on their behalf. Why? Because they have bought into the line. And now they're trying to, to, to help divine the races. Because united we stand, divided we fall into captivity. And many people are in captivity today. Some people even take it a step further. They're like offended on steroids. Some are even offended on behalf of aliens, if you can believe that. Try to fathom that in your spare time. And let us leave this camping ground now and move on before somebody gets offended. 
Look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus. Everybody seems to be caught up in his or her little world, seeking his or her own interests. What's in it for me? How does this benefit me? They have almost forgotten Jesus. It is him we are to please. It is him we are to obey no matter what. It's all about Jesus. Yet we stick up posters and signs like this one. I can only please one person per day. And today is not your day. Tomorrow doesn't look good either. I mean, it's cute and all of that. It's funny. But I want to tell you this. If that person per day was Jesus, how great would that be? How wonderful, how marvelous would this world would be that we, we live in? But usually that person itself. We have become a generation of lovers of self. But why? Jesus himself prophesied in Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The word lawlessness implies a sense of judgment, since it implies that there is a law, but the law is ignored and so gives a sense of wrongdoing. There will be no regard for the law of God. There will be no regard for the law of man in the last days. And I'm pretty sure that we're living in those days right now. Look around with an unbiased eye and see what is really, really going on. And if you're convinced, or if you're not convinced, then I don't know what else to say. All of the media giants are censoring anything and everything that does not line up with their perspective or lines up with their agenda. And they pay people like you and me to do it. Unbelievable what people would do for money, even to their own demise. A friend of mine sent me a video about an evangelist. His name is Torben Sundergaard. Apparently, he came to America to escape religious persecution in his homeland of Denmark. He has since been arrested by ICE and has been in jail for almost three months now and has not been officially charged with any crime. I didn't hear about it until my friend sent me the link. And we'll post a link below for anyone who's interested to learn more. And I was astonished that something like that could even happen here in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. Yet, here it is. Look at all the other stuff that's going on. And the people are helping to enslave their own selves. They're helping to put their own selves in captivity. Things like this don't stir us to action. It's like water on a duck's back, as they say. We see it, and then we quickly forget it. Because it do not affect us, at least not yet. We're too caught up with our own problems. But if we took the time to consider things of God, we would not lose our love for God so quickly. We cannot let life, we cannot let things, we cannot let society steal our love or our excitement for Jesus and the things of God. We must stay informed. We must stay excited. And all the more as we see that day approaching. I remember another time when a co-worker of mine was in a certain mood because things hadn't gone their way or the way that they had envisioned it. And I remember the time when somebody told me, you're the Christian. So I said, we don't let things like this get us down. We don't let things like this throw us because we're Christians. And just saying that we're Christians, 
sparked something inside me. And to tell you the truth, I started to get a little excited when I heard myself say it. And if you ask me why, I couldn't tell you. But just hearing myself say, we are Christians, got me so excited that I began to say it over and over and over. We are Christians. We are Christians. We are Christians. And I believe I even started to get louder and louder on every, we are Christians. And in my mind, I was getting so excited. So I truly thought that this person was getting excited with me. I even wanted people around us to hear me say, we are Christians. So that we could get them excited on being a Christian as well. But the reverse had taken the effect. It infuriated my coworker, and I couldn't believe it. I was hurt to the bone that they took it the wrong way, whatever that wrong way was. I just couldn't believe it. We're not excited about the things of God anymore like we once were. We've lost the passion somehow. It is because we've become lovers of self rather than lovers of God. We have left our first love. We simply do not put the things of God first anymore. Not like they did in the Bible times when Peter, James, and John, and Paul, and Barnabas, and Silas, and all the others taught the things of God when they led the church. We take our liberty in Christ for granted. We believe that we are the apple of God's eye. Therefore, God will never allow us to see hardship. He will never allow us or permit us to feel any type of pain or any discomfort. We will always be in the zone. After all, God wants me happy. That is taking things for granted. But listen to this story of the vacuum cleaner salesman who took things for granted. A vacuum cleaner salesman knocked on the door of a remote farmhouse one day. When the lady of the house opened the door, he promptly walked in and dumped a bag of dirt right in the middle of her floor. Now, he boasted, I want to make a bargain with you. If this super duper vacuum cleaner doesn't pick up every bit of dirt, I will eat what's left. Here's a spoon, said the farmer's wife. We don't have any electricity. You see, the salesman took for granted the house had electricity. He never thought for one moment of the possibility that the house might not have electricity. The problem is many, many Christians are just like that salesman. We take our freedoms for granted. We take God for granted. We take his goodness for granted. We take his grace for granted. And in so doing, we trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. We knock God off of his throne and then we enthrone ourselves upon his throne and in his place because God wants me happy. And he wants me happy at all costs. We never once consider that God is a God of mercy, a God of grace, but he's also a God of justice and a God of judgment. Listen, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Jesus bought and paid for you. Jesus bought and paid for me. We are no longer our own person. We are no longer, uh, our, our, we don't no longer get to call our own shots. We don't no longer get to say what happened in our life. Because we are no longer our own. Why? Because your life, my life, does not belong to me or to you anymore. You got to, you got to, you have to understand that. You have to get that deep down inside you. If you're going to live the victorious life, you've got to come to terms with that concept. You are not your own. Paul expounded on this same subject in this way in Romans chapter 14, verse seven through nine. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 
For this end, Christ died and lived again, and that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So whether we live or whether we die, we do it all as unto the Lord, since it is him who died for each and every one of us. Therefore, he owns each and every one of us. We need a t-shirt that says, God own, or one that says, no longer a self-lover. We, as Christians, must recklessly abandon ourselves to the Lord. We must strongly and enthusiastically believe that He will do what is best for us. He will do what is right by us. His decisions are in our best interests. Praise the Lord. If we believe that, if we believe that statement that we just made, without a doubt, we will not have a problem abandoning ourselves to God. Do not be fooled. God is not mocked. We have to live like God knows what is going on and nothing takes him by surprise. I read a story about a man who was making money hand over fist charging a 9% interest rate on loans. When a customer asked him, don't you fear God's frowning on such questionable transactions? He replied, ah, no, my friend. When God looks down on the nine, it's like he sees a six. Well, the truth is, God does not, not look down and see a six instead of a nine. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly what you're thinking. He knows exactly what's in your heart. He knows your thoughts even before you think them. So when God looks down, he does not see a six instead of a nine. He sees a nine. He is not confused. He's not a doting old grandfather who is easily fooled. Remember, God proclaims the end from the beginning. He calls those things that are not as if they are. He speaks and it comes into being. There is no God like our God. There is no rock like our rock. So let me ask you, do you know that rock today? I'm not talking about the rock John Johnson, but the solid rock. The rock that the wise man built his house upon. And the rains fell, and the floods rose, and the wind came against it and blew against it. But the house stood firm. Do you know this rock? Is he your Lord and Savior? If he isn't, would you like to know him? Would you like him to be your Lord and Savior today? Would you like him to be your solid rock that you can build on that found, that firm foundation. If you would, here's how. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I acknowledge my sin and I ask you for forgiveness. I ask you to lead me in paths of righteousness. Help me to see truth. Help me not to be offended. But, oh Lord God, that I can cast all my cares, all my worries, all of my hurts, all of my concerns upon you. For I know you care for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I accept your free gift of life now in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do now is to buy your uh, Bible uh, or, or get your Bible off the shelf and begin to read your Bible every single day. Get a highlighter. Highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. Those verses that can help you. And then find yourself a Bible-believing church. One that believes there's a right way and a wrong way to live. The church that believes that thus saith the Lord, there's a way of holiness. Not one of those progressive churches that embraces the world and the things of the world, but a Bible-believing church. That's who Jesus is coming back for. Join that church. 
Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.